the expansion activists who've actually been at the forefront of arguing for this. They dismissed all of the concerns early on as, oh, there's no slippery slope. You don't need to worry about a slippery slope. And that's one area where I agree with them because we haven't seen a slippery slope in Canada. We have fallen off a cliff. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Life on Film. My name is Kevin Dunn. This is the first Life on Film since the National March for Life just a few weeks ago in Ottawa. Tonight, we have the first episode of Made in Canada, a brand new series from Unveiled TV. The Kuman Brothers, they are going to be joining us very, very shortly. Um, this first episode is called Made for the Vulnerable. Uh, in this series, this is the first of a number of series, which we'll find out more tonight, Unveil TV interviews Canadian medical experts, disability advocates, legal experts and veterans and other leading voices to uncover the truth about doctor assisted suicide here in Canada. Again, under that horrible euphemism we call made medical aid and dying euthanasia. That's what it is. It's what it's called. Anyway, we're going to talk more about it now with uh, Daniel and Matthew Kuman from Unveiled TV. Uh, good to see you, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. You're coming to us from Vancouver. Vancouver Island. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Awesome. It's great. Great to see. You. I know uh, uh, I got to meet you in person, which was just lovely uh, a few weeks ago. I guess like a couple of months ago now. Uh, <laughs> everything's a blur leading up to the March for Life. Um, uh, as you interviewed me for this series, and I, I was honored because we we kind of walked uh, walking in the same footsteps as uh, dealing with this issue. Uh, I done a few films a few years ago with uh, with my friend Alex Schoenberg. Um, But you guys are you guys are like. This is just amazing that you're doing this series now. Um, I have to ask, uh, you know, what can we expect tonight from this first episode? I know we're gonna we're gonna chat after, um, but what can we expect tonight for this first episode? We're just about to get into it. Yeah, well, the first one it's kind of a an introduction to just how far this has come in a few short years. I think when you did your stories, Kevin, it was like you were among the few that were seeing where this could head. And I would like to call that, you know, kind of being at the front line, early adopters, seeing what was coming. And I really do honor and appreciate the work that you and Alex and others have done around this issue, because some people have been talking about this for years. For us, it was when the sole condition of mental illness as something coming for euthanasia, where um, that that's in the legislation upcoming, and it really is very unsettling. Um, there's so many aspects of this issue that are unsettling, but in this first part, we're kind of trying to introduce people, imagining if we didn't know that much about the issue, which honestly, uh, even a couple of years ago, we didn't know enough. And um, we're kind of introducing in this first part, this is where it started. This is where it's heading. Watch out. It's going even further. And uh, that's kind of what people can expect to see in this first part. Matthew, do you have anything to tell our uh, viewers before we uh, before we head into this first episode? Yeah, I mean, to second a bit what Dan said there, we feel like we're five, six years behind the eight ball here. We feel like we're coming to this a little bit late. I think when we talk about the issue, people are always baffled that they haven't heard more about it or didn't know it was so dramatic, what's happening in our country. Um, and to be honest, around the world, there's really a push for this all over the place. And just in our own country, and especially here on Vancouver Island, we're, we're the epicenter of um, medical assisted deaths in Canada, um, up to 15% of all deaths are made on Vancouver Island. And so that's where we are. And it's shocking. And that's the problem with it is that we should know more about this. And mm -hmm. it's if this is the reality, we need to know more. So episode one is really, it's a bit of a education. It's, it's not like a deep dive into into the whole issue. But it really does give you some of the like, framework for how we've gotten to the point we're currently at and how it's affecting Canadians. Well, we just uh, we just can't say enough. Uh, uh, grateful to you both for for allowing us to air this as part of Life on Film, uh, Life on Film series with the National March for Life. Uh, will, uh, will you stick around after the episode and we, and we can have a little uh, further chat? Sure. Sounds good. 
Great. Well, uh, to invite all of you to stay tuned, uh, enjoy this, uh, enjoy this episode, but stay tuned after as we uh, interview the Kuman brothers um, for a little post show uh, Q and A. But for now, we will roll. Life on film. Pleased to present this first episode of Made in Canada. Made for the vulnerable is the name of the episode. Enjoy, learn, and uh, yeah, let's see where we're at in this uh, in this country. The expansion activists who've actually been at the forefront of arguing for this, they dismissed all of the concerns early on as, oh, there's no slippery slope. You don't need to worry about a slippery slope. And that's one area where I agree with them because we haven't seen a slippery slope in Canada. We have fallen off a cliff. And I don't know how far we're going to keep falling. The number of Canadians dying by maid is growing on track to become one of the most permissive euthanasia jurisdictions in the world. Uh, this government is focused very much on respecting Canadians' rights, uh, defending uh, their choices and allowing them choices while at the same time protecting the most vulnerable in society. We've gone from assisted suicide to assisted dying to medical assistance in dying to maids that we can use a totally different term. Given, I think, uh, the relatively few uh, complaints about the system that have come forward, given, given the numbers, um, I think the system's working well. I have a letter saying that if you are so desperate, madam, uh, we can offer you maid medical assistance in dying. Like, who gets to say whose life is valuable? And why do they get to say that? Somebody is standing on the ledge, do we push or do we pull? Because these are opposite things and our society believes in both right now. What do we do? So the background is that when the law first came in, in 2016, that came in after a Supreme Court ruling in 2015. So the initial law was something that came on the heels of the Carter Supreme Court ruling, in which the Supreme Court said that the blanket prohibition, right? So the up until then blanket prohibition against assisted dying breached our charter. And they essentially said that there needs to be some pathways for people to be able to apply for this under certain circumstances. They didn't say that under all circumstances. And it wasn't specifically defined per se. Um, it didn't involve any cases of mental illness. Actually, none of the cases that are shaping our laws informed cases of mental illness. That's how the initial set of safeguards came about, the first law in C-14. So again, adult, competent, grievous and irremediable, and natural death needing to be reasonably foreseeable. So in 2015, the Supreme Court of Canada uh, issued its decision in Carter and effectively struck down uh, the law as it existed at that time, the, uh, the total prohibition on assisted suicide, and uh, directed Parliament uh, saying that it was overbroad and directing Parliament to create a series of what the court described as um, stringently limited, scrupulously monitored exceptions. The Carter case is, uh, it, it's about suicide and, and homicide. People want to deny that. People um, very much take issue on the on the other side, on the pro-euthanasia side, with characterizing this as you know, akin to suicide. But the reality is, in the criminal code, there's only one you know, so-called healthcare service that's regulated in the criminal code, and that is made. You know, it's not a matter of criminal law making healthcare decisions. It's regulated by the provinces and, and so on. But made is, if it's not a doctor doing it, it's murder. If it's, you know, you haven't signed the consent forms and so on, there, it's just, there's this line between this is a social good, a service that we will pay for and approve as the government. But if you're on the other side of that line, it's one of the most serious crimes in our country. I would have preferred that it would be broader. We need to empower individuals to choose how to manage the end of their lives and give value to the Law Reform Commission the idea of patient-centered approach. And we need to consider not only the quantity of life, but quality. We need to respect people's autonomy and the right to be free from suffering without putting vulnerable Canadians at risk. Uh, so Parliament responded with a piece of legislation called Bill C-14. That was the first euthanasia law in Canada. And initially, it limited assisted death 
uh, for individuals who met certain criteria. Uh, one of those criteria was that a person's death had to be reasonably foreseeable. That's the legal language from the legislation. So in other words, someone already had to be on the trajectory towards death. That's why we called it medical assistance in dying, because someone was already dying. Now, this was a legislation that had some safeguards. Um, it was meant to be for people with a grievous and irremediable illness. It was meant to be for people who had a reasonably foreseeable natural death, and they could access made within still a very short amount of time as an exceptional procedure for people who were dying and we had nothing left to offer them. I do not believe that that was played out, but that's how it was introduced, what it was meant to be in terms of the spirit of the legislation. A number of people felt that that itself was too narrow, too restrictive, and argued that it was unfair and arbitrary to withhold assisted death from someone who is suffering just because they aren't already dying. So that last safeguard was challenged in a Quebec court case in Truchon in Quebec. It was September 11th, 2019, that the ruling came in. And it was ruled on by a single judge. And she found, in her opinion, that the reasonably foreseeable natural death criterion was overly restrictive. And there, a judge of the Superior Court of Quebec agreed that Parliament should not restrict assisted death to the end-of-life context. You have heard a consistent message from disability rights defenders to stop the carnage of Track 2. You must do everything within your power to reinstate the equality-affirming requirement for reasonably foreseeable natural death and delay indefinitely any further expansion of Track 2 made. These measures will save lives, but they will not restore equality or undo the incalculable damage from a catastrophic social experiment. So from a strictly legal perspective, from a just like a news perspective, um, it was a lower court in Quebec. It was, and the government did not appeal it. Um, they never asked the Supreme Court of Canada for a reference. There were a bunch of other legal options that they had. I think it's a big deal for a court to ask the government to do that. You don't do that lightly. They had legal recourse. They had things they could have done and they chose not to do it. After speaking with members of the disability community extensively and hearing the eloquent testimony of disability advo advocacy organizations at committee, I am convinced that the entire creation of this second track and in fact purpose of this legislation is discriminatory. Justice Minister David Lametti uh, was opposed to the original legislation, C-14, because he didn't think that it was broad enough. What's interesting is that ordinarily a decision like that of a single judge of a lower court in a single province uh, would be something that Parliament would and could appeal and have it subject to the benefit of judicial review of an appellate court in Quebec or at this, and also ultimately at the Supreme Court of Canada because this is a policy that impacts the entire country and is one of fundamental concern. The second track singles out only the disability community and implies that their lives are not worth living. This is a charter protected group that has been singled out and unjustifiably discriminated against. Uh, we urged Parliament to appeal that decision. We felt there were issues, concerns and problems in the reasoning, uh, but Parliament chose not to do so and instead expanded the law for the entire country uh, to now make assisted dying available even for someone who is not dying, for someone who is not at the end of their lives. This entire bill is a colossal, spectacular failure on the part of the government. It is unacceptable. And I, for one, am for hitting pause on this situation. Thank you. This critical piece of legislation has been well debated. I look forward to the Senate receiving our reply and for C7 to receive royal assent. Canadians are expecting us to get the job done and indeed they're expecting us to move on to the next steps. If you had any disease that was considered irremediable or significant, you could apply for MAID. 
So then what happens is it comes up to the doctor to decide. So some cases that have been approved uh, for medical assistance in dying have been things like type 1 diabetes, um, hearing loss, um, uh, blindness, chronic pain, fragility, mild strokes. Uh, many of these things where people actually would, with uh, our med our regular medical care, would have thrived are qualifying for medical assistance in dying. Now we're providing MAID to people in their 20s, 30s, 40s who could have multiple decades left to live. They're not in the process of dying. It is then no longer medical assistance in dying. It is medically assisted or medically administered death or physician assisted death. In Canada, most of the cases are actually euthanasia, meaning it's an act that's performed by the medical provider rather than the person themselves. Typically what happens is that um, the person is sedated so that they're relaxed, then they're paralyzed so that they can't move, and then their heart is stopped. As we expand our laws beyond helping people ease end-of-life suffering and then expand it, what you see is that people start to respond to other life suffering and social suffering for things that fuel their requests for MAID. And that's exactly what we're seeing. There was this growing momentum of public concern and backlash. The United Nations, like three special rapporteurs, wrote to the government of Canada saying we have serious grave concerns about this legislation and we still passed it. Nothing surprises me anymore. It makes me sad, but I'm no longer surprised and I'm no longer shocked. In my opinion, it's entirely a political push because it's been something where what I've seen is that since, and by the way, I should mention, you know, I'm not saying this as a conscientious objector. You know, as I mentioned, I chair a hospital MAID team, and I wouldn't do that unless I thought there's a role for MAID in appropriate situations. I'm saying this as somebody who's become increasingly concerned about the complete absence and actually uh, neglect and ignoring of evidence as our policies have expanded. And in that expansion, if that expansion is not based on evidence, because it very clearly isn't, then what's left for it to be based on? Ideology, which then means, yes, it's been a essentially political push. I do believe that. Uh, the plan we put forward is one that respects Canadians' uh, choices uh, while putting in place uh, the kinds of safeguards needed. Uh, but as uh, we highlighted as part of the plan, the extraordinary work that the uh, Special Joint Committee did uh, looking at various aspects of uh, the difficult choices that Canadians are facing. I have a form of muscular dystrophy called spinal muscular atrophy. It basically means that uh, over time, my muscles get weaker and weaker. So I'm at the point now where um, I need help with most things throughout the day. So I use an electric wheelchair for my mobility. Um, the way I explain it to people generally to give them a sense of where I'm at, if somebody is able to place my hands on a computer keyboard and mouse, I have enough strength and capability in the fingers and wrists to use the computer and mouse independently. But outside of that, I basically need full help uh, with everything else. So it is definitely a significant disability um, and it requires round the clock care to be able to function independently and you know have a good quality of life. Up until now, I lived with my parents. Uh, so initially with both my father and mother, but my father passed away from cancer and then uh, you know, several years later, uh, just recently, last October, my mother passed away from cancer as well. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I do not have a permanent primary caregiver. And that's kind of the crux of my situation. It's a challenging spot to be in because the sort of healthcare system is not really 
built to, to kind of deal with these sort of exceptional cases like mine, where without a familial, familial caregiver, you basically fall through the cracks uh, unless you're willing to be institutionalized. A few years ago, I talked through the issue of assisted suicide with a few friends of mine who hold the opposite view. They were saying like, look, it's about freedom and autonomy and people with disabilities should have that choice as well. I met up with them again after the law had been expanded so that people with disabilities qualify for assisted suicide in Canada now. And my friend said to me, you were right. You said that Canada's policy would select for disability and that people with disabilities would not get an equal right to suicide prevention and they would get assistance committing suicide just even for other reasons simply because they were eligible for having a disability and that's what's happening in canada now like it's gone from um a theoretical argument to just being undeniable with all the stories coming out right it's it's that um somebody is suicidal because of a lack of social support or because of a housing crisis or because of a financial struggle. They happen to have a disability, so they happen to be eligible, and suddenly they're in this other class in society where suicide is an option on the table in a way that it would never be for me. I, I'm not living with a disability. No one is, is putting suicide as an option on the table if I'm struggling with finances or if I'm struggling with a lack of social support, but we're doing that for people with disabilities. And whether or not that's the intention of the government, I think that is the obvious impact of the policy. And I've heard from friends with disabilities who've also struggled with mental health, that they're quite concerned about our current policy because they have thought about suicide or even attempted suicide. And the notion that if they struggle again and go through a dark few months or a dark year that's simply because they also have a disability suddenly it's an option on the table for our government and medical professionals to assist them in killing themselves rather than offering unconditional suicide prevention i think it's just an undeniable reality of the current government policy that it's ableist and discriminates against people with disabilities the plain reading of the law is if you have a disability, you're eligible for MAID. And then it's just about, you know, proving that you're experiencing enduring phys physical or psychological suffering that cannot be relieved by any means that you deem acceptable. Well, that's very subjective. It's very much based on what the patient says that they want because we're quote unquote all about patient autonomy in this. If I'm having, just speaking for myself as somebody who's not seeking an assisted death, um, if I'm having a bad day because of my disability, because a bunch of other things happened related to it, subjectively, yeah, it feels really terrible and it's a bad day. And in my experience, like most of us who live with disabilities, you just kind of come to know like that is a normal part of living with one. It's fact of life. Um, but me in my context, I know, you know, this is a day or this is a season of time and it will change. Um, I will learn different coping strategies or some other outside factor in my life will change. But a doctor may not know that. They've never lived with Likely, they've never lived with a disability their whole life. So you hear this story of, you know, this person's really upset. How do you know this isn't enduring? Because it sounds like it is. Under the old system, there was what was essentially a 10-day reflection period, where once they actually are, you know, approved for potentially receiving MAID, they then had a minimum 10-day period to reflect on it and then if they continued to want to um, kind of proceed, they could get made after that. I will let you know that we actually had some people change their minds during that 10 day period. So some people who were convinced they wanted it, they go through the assessments, they're approved for it, they still want it, but then on day 10, 11, 12, they actually said, I don't want it anymore. And typically those are situations where not much change in their medical condition, but something changed in their social condition where they had 
a re-engagement with, say, family that had otherwise um, been kind of separated from them for a long time. The new process, the track one is somewhat similar to that, except you now no longer have any required reflection period. That many people in the disability community don't feel safe going to the hospital. Right? Already there was some concern that when they would show up, they need to have an advocate who says, this person's life is worth living. Please do not make them DNR automatically. Please do not assume that they will not want simple antibiotics for their pneumonia when they would have recovered because you think they're better off dead. There's already been that problem of people accessing healthcare and being seen as um, not, you know, perhaps even with sympathy or some sort of false compassion. The doctor saying like, I'd be doing your service by ending your life. But imagine now, when you're extremely vulnerable in a hospital and someone might offer you medical assistance in dying. The disability filibuster wrote a statement um, to one of the colleges saying, we need safe spaces. We don't feel safe going to the hospital to access care. We don't have safe doctors and safe spaces. And we're worried that when we are at our lowest, we might accept medical assistance in dying because that's what suicidality is. Um, even though we knew that we would have recovered if we're given time. Many months ago, when the government had said that they will be introducing made for mental illness in March of 2023, I made the decision last summer that I would be stepping down and no longer involved in MADE when that happened. So I personally have made the decision that if and when MADE expands to sole mental illness, I will no longer be involved in the process. So I was born about three months premature. Um, in October 1988. And like many premature infants, I spent the first three months or so of my life in a neonatal intensive care unit. Um, my parents, whenever they would tell me the story when I was growing up, they always emphasized how blessed we were as a family. Uh, um, I was born in London, Ontario, a city with many university hospitals. They, the NICU was in the city. Um, my parents didn't have to fly in they didn't have to like take tons of time off of work to be with me right like it was right there mom would say you should be glad we don't live in america because we would be living in a cardboard box because of all the medical expenses um my dad didn't have the highest paying of jobs and like premiums are expensive and i remember when i graduated from high school i was like hey mom do you think that we would have like moved out of our cardboard box by now and she was like yeah i think we'd be living in a van um so yeah i was always taught to be very grateful for the healthcare in this country um and i am and what concerns me especially when we start talking about what appears to be made for disability um and this idea that our healthcare system can no longer handle people living is i was taught to respect the medical profession. And to this day, when I meet a NICU nurse or doctor, I go up and I tell them, hey, I want you to know I was a preemie. Because my mom told me that they don't always get to see you after you grew up and they, they want to know, right? And they always say, thank you. And they ask how old I am. And I say, I'm 34. And they ask, how big were you? And I say, one pound, 12 and a half ounces. And we joke about how the half and ounce matters. And they say that, you know, you know you're lucky. So then, as a journalist decades later, I'm talking to somebody to find out information about another story, and they say, hey, have you heard about this thing called MAID? Because we're hearing about blind people applying for it or asking about it. And my blindness is, an exact, is like a direct consequence of the fact that I live in a country that was able to keep me alive and just because of the way you develop gestationally, the eyes run the last thing, so if you're born significantly early, you get vision loss often. And it's almost as if the government is saying, oh, we're sorry, like, joke. <laughs> Actually, we didn't mean to keep you alive 34 years ago. We've decided it's not worth it anymore. If you decide, you know, like, yeah, we don't actually have sufficient social assistance programs. So instead of actually fixing the problem, if you decide that you don't want to wait for us to, like, make things better, don't worry. We have an easy out. And instead of giving you an intravenous to keep you alive because you're in a NICU, right? Have you seen all those machines and tubes? Like, it's fascinating. We can give you another one. And it's okay. 
don't worry. You tried hard. It's something that really has come up just within the last few months after my mother passed away is that generally speaking, um, you, you know, it might sound really strange, but generally speaking up until now, I didn't really feel disabled. So I, I felt like I was living a fulfilled life. You know, I was able to function much as any able-bodied person would be able to function. And, you know, I, I was content and happy. But now without that primary caregiver, then, you, you know, that kind of overwhelming reality starts setting in like, wow, I really am disabled. If I can't get this care, then what do I do? What are my options? I need to go in an institution and sit in soiled diapers because they won't have time to, you know, help me with toileting when I need it. I mean, those things were not things that I had to worry about because I could always count on the support of my mother or father, right? And I was able to function. But now it's just, yeah, I'm like this, I definitely feel much, much more disabled. And, you know, it's not, it's not a great feeling. So I'm hoping that I can at least find a way forward to get the care that I need at home and carry on for as long as I can. If the perspective through suffering is that this suffering is going to get worse, there's unimaginable things that might or could happen to you, um, your life might be very short, then that leads to despair. And as, as Viktor Frankl once said, he said, despair is suffering without meaning. And if that's the perspective that we're portraying to children who are suffering from terminal illness, then I can agree with you that might lead to despair, which could include a request for medical assistance in dying. But if the perspective is, as our experience, right from the very day that Marcus's oncologist said to him, there's nothing more we can do. When Marcus asked him, how, how long do I have? The doctor said, we don't know, and we're not going to focus on that. We're going to focus on living every day you have well, and we're going to do everything we can to ensure you can live every day you have well. That perspective does not lead to despair, and that perspective does not lead to someone's request to ask a doctor to euthanize him or her. I think the way that we usually think about suffering is wrong. I think a lot of people think whether or not you have hope or despair in the face of suffering depends on how much suffering you're facing. That's not what Viktor Frankl found in the Holocaust and in his mental health practice. What he found is that whether you were dealing with a, a relatively smaller amount of suffering, like from a breakup, or extreme suffering like in a Nazi concentration camp, what determined whether someone had hope or despair is not the level of suffering, but whether or not someone had a sense of meaning and purpose in the face of suffering. And he survived the Holocaust with the firm conviction that it is always possible to find meaning and purpose in life, even in the face of extreme suffering. D equals S minus M, despair is suffering without meaning. It becomes a formula for hope because we realize that meaning and purpose are the antidote to suicidal despair. So even in very challenging situations where somebody is facing a, a very difficult situation and they might no longer have hope in the circumstances that they're facing. I think that we should not lose hope for them. We can always alleviate suffering as much as we can and help people to find meaning and purpose and at the end of life, help people to find closure in order to affirm the dignity of their life and never give in to suicidal despair. Not to get all existential here, but there is a philosophical part of this, right? If we believe that all pain and all suffering is terrible and must be eliminated at all costs, and there is no way that you could live a good, hopeful life, even with suffering being part of that, then made is a natural conclusion. So yes, I do think on the policy level, we need to think about access to employment and affordable, accessible, appropriate housing and better social supports and all those things. But then we also have to consider how do people view life? Um, what do they think makes a meaningful life? One of the things I've noticed interviewing individuals who are considering MAID, not all of them, but there is um, often stories of childhood abuse um, and trauma that may not be directly connected to the disability. So it's compounding factors 
and some of those things you can't necessarily address through a law or a directive or policy. There are certain groups um, that we're offering this to. Kalesha also, stigma, uh, discrimination, we're very concerned that our legislation is made in a way that actually discriminates against people, certain groups of people, targets them for death instead of solutions. And while this is framed as this is autonomy, this is about their choice, is it really more about the fact that we might, as a society, care less about these groups? You know, as opposed to like an 18-year-old healthy young person going to university, maybe we care less about these groups and therefore are more comfortable with them ending their lives. And that's a, a huge ethical issue. Like, who gets to say whose life is valuable? And why do they get to say that? So, um, we're talking the beginning of March a couple of weeks ago. A joint committee report was re released where a committee of um, House of Commons and Senators is recommending that the government of Canada consider expanding May to mature minors. And in this report, they are clear that they only want that to be track one, which again is naturally reasonably foreseeable death. But they have another recommendation that says that they want to consult more um, about this with mature minors, so including mature minors who have terminal illnesses, um, indigenous youth, uh, so including youth with disabilities. Um, I'm 34, I've had a disability since I was born, I guess. And the thought of sitting down with like a 13 year old me who's going through puberty as a visually impaired girl and do you know what it's like to learn how to shave your legs when you're legally blind? It's a little terrifying for everyone involved. Um, and now, like, we have to try to say, oh, by the way, there's this thing called maid? Like, what? Um, and, like, now when I have to give those somewhat strange inspirational talks about, like, hey, I'm an adult with a disability and I'm still alive, like, my life is good, I have to tell a bunch of teenagers that your disability is never a reason for you to kill yourself. It's never a reason for you to get the government to do it. It's never a reason for somebody to suggest that they should do it. What is the role of suffering? And that I'm not saying that we should wish bad things or want for bad things, but that um, there, it's not, we don't live in an either or situation here you can have both and that there can be hard things and good things going together at the same time and i feel like a lot of the rhetoric around made is like oh no that can't be possible uh, in 2021 when our son was diagnosed with ewing sarcoma which is a it, it's a terminal cancer right from the outset um it was as though god was taking us on that that personal journey that allowed us to speak into the topic uh, with more legitimacy if you will it wasn't just a policy issue that you could make the reasoned argument for. It was something that you actually experienced. We knew that the committee had a certain persuasion already. So we felt they're probably going to hear our story and then just say, thank you very much. And that would, that would be it. Uh, but they actually used the, I think it was about 45 minutes straight of questions. So we had about 12 questions from MPs and senators. Some of them, you could tell they were sympathetic to, to where we were going and, and our recommendation was please do not expand euthanasia to mature minors, to children in our country. But, but most of the senators and MPs asked questions because while they could understand our experience, they couldn't understand how, how we couldn't understand other people's experience. And why can't other people choose something different just because you don't want to choose that doesn't mean they might not want to choose that. Uh, so we were trying to communicate to the committee that you can't make this legal for some because they might want to choose it and not ensure that everyone else is going to have to consider it at some point. And just that act of considering is devaluing in and of itself. But if somebody had come to Marcus at any stage during that, that period of palliative and hospice care and said to him, Marcus, it, it's going to get even worse than this, and you might want to consider requesting medical assistance in dying. He, he very distinctly would have heard, oh, the doc's giving up on me now. And that would have been so demoralizing for him. That would have, that would have decreased the ability for him 
to live each one of those days well as you move forward towards the, the end day. And Saturday morning, when he was still with us, and I said to him, Marcus, should I see if your buddies are able to come to the hospice? These, these friends that you see on the picture right in front of you. His eyes lit up. And he said, if you could, that would be so good. And he had 90 minutes of time with them where he wouldn't have had that time if the decision for medical assistance in dying had happened. And he had that time because everyone around him, from his parents to his healthcare providers, valued his dignity, valued his life, and did everything they could to ensure that he lived well, even though he was dying. Even though over the course of two months, he drowned to death as his lungs filled with tumors. There's not much more a terrible way you can go. But we can in our country, and, and our experience is, is proof of that. We can care for each other and give each other that dignity so that the requests were made doesn't have to be there. In my particular case, it feels like it, it's, it, it's really the, the solution to, to the wrong problem. It's not the right solution. It shouldn't really even be a question of, well, do you want made? Right? We should be asking ourselves, why are you even considering that at this point? You know, how how are we, you know, what gaps are there that, that are leading you to start considering this? I'm not at end of life, right? I'm, I'm not in pain. I'm able to still function. I'm able to maintain myself through a job. It's just that I'm facing, you know, the very real possibility of living the rest of my life in a very indignified manner, sitting in soiled diapers on a regular basis simply because, you know, the, the, the outreach care model just doesn't provide sufficient supports for me. If you don't uh, think that assisted suicide is ever okay, you don't need to choose that for yourself, but people should be able to make their individual choice and the government should be neutral. And what we'll point out in conversation is that um, there is no neutral. Right? Like, if we are legalizing the practice, we're saying, actually, this can be a good thing. We'll pay for it with tax dollars. Doctors can provide it. Like, our, the institutions of law and medicine are involved. It is not neutral. If we're, I mean, to define eligibility criteria is not neutral. It is the government making a decision of who qualifies for suicide and who gets unconditional suicide prevention. There is no neutral. Once we legalize it and make it available, there is a judgment of who we make it available to, of who our government thinks suicide might make sense for. So there is no neutral. There is a need to have this conversation about value and life and mental health and suicide prevention. And there's no neutral option where everybody could just make their own choice. We are making a decision of who we think as a society is better off alive and who we think is better off dead, who we will um, unconditionally defend and whose lives we're willing to end. So on February 13th, I instructed HCCSS to refer me to do my first mate assessment. I'm considering it because unless there, you know, becomes, uh, unless some glimmer of hope becomes visible, then fundamentally the situation I'm facing with the current care that I receive at home, uh, if all goes well, I might have enough hours and care staff to get me out of bed in the morning and put me into bed at night, which then leaves me for, you know, let's say 12 to 16 hours without care throughout the day. And mm -hmm. so that basically means I'm going to be sitting in soil diapers all day long, and that is not something that I think I'll be able to tolerate for any extended period of time. You know, the, the expansion activists who've actually been at the forefront of arguing for this, they dismissed all of the concerns early on as, oh, there's no slippery slope. You don't need to worry about a slippery slope. And that's one area where I agree with them. Because we haven't seen a slippery slope in Canada. We have fallen off a cliff. And I don't know how far we're going to keep falling. But I do hope that at some point caution comes in. And again, I think that caution is going to be when the public realizes what really is at risk here. I actually think it's a lot more than, you know, I don't want to overplay this in terms of what it means. But 
when we think about fundamental questions of what society helps people to do to live versus how we provide death, that strikes at the soul of the country. It's a huge issue. And I just cannot believe that when most Canadians realize what's going on, they would support it. It's better than blowing your brains out against the wall. That is what he told me, she said. Very sensitive of her. I have a letter saying that if you are so desperate, madam, uh, we can offer you made medical assistance in dying. So I guess this is where we're at now. We want to live, we could have the equipment to live, but I guess it'd be more reasonable for the system if we just die. Incredible work. Incredible work by the Cumin Brothers on Vail TV. Uh, this series made in Canada. That, you just watched the first episode of six. Uh, I'm joined here again with our friends, Matthew and Daniel Cumin, the Cumin Brothers from Unveil TV, producers, directors uh, of the program. Um, uh, Matthew, uh, this is one of six episodes. Um, tell us, tell us what we can expect with the, with the rest of the series. Yeah, well, we teased the um, second episode there, which is talking about the heroes of Canada, um, the veterans and the treatment that they're getting with medical assistance in dying or made, which, yeah, again, is such a terrible way to describe it, which hopefully you got from that first episode, which is yeah. these people aren't necessarily dying. So medical assistance in dying is actually an inappropriate way of explaining it because um, that some people aren't at that state in life yeah. um so we're talking a bit about um the veterans and then we have an episode um that will talk about the organ donation euthanasia which canada is a leader in that um we're kind of leading the way in some of all the wrong things here um we also are talking about suicide and how it's a dilemma the suicide dilemma with euthanasia because we've been telling people for decades that we can help them if they have issues and they have ideation of suicide. And now we're saying we can help you by ending your life with suicide. It's a very, like, that's a very big dilemma. So we're, we're going to touch on that. Um, we're also going to discuss the eugenics kind of ethics angle of it. Um, we reference it a bit in that first episode with, what happened in Nazi Germany and how eugenics played a part. And there's the ethical eugenic kind of issue is, is also something that we want to touch. And then we're also going to talk about the money and how is there a money, a financial angle to this whole thing that is being pushed under the rug. And uh, we believe there is. So we're, we're delving into that a little bit. Uh, thank you for that. D Daniel, um, your biggest takeaway, I mean, uh, forgive me, are you both directing? I think, are, are you directing? You're, you're directing? We're both directing, yeah. Both directing. Um, 
So your biggest takeaway as a, as a, as a co-director, maybe I'll throw the same question to Matthew, your biggest takeaway, obviously you're diving into this. You mentioned that you're a little behind the eight ball. I don't think so. I think you, you guys are <laughs> doing an amazing job. Um, but what was your biggest takeaway uh, as, as, as a director interviewing these people throughout the series without giving away the rest of the series? Yeah, no, I think um, if I'm being brutally honest and um, also somewhat repentant, um, I would have to admit that there was a little tiny window in the back of my head that thought there might be a use case for this. A lot of the people that you talk to, they feel that way. But as I actually looked at it, actually did the research, dove deep and started talking to real people, I believe there is an absolute prohibition from like, I, I, I believe that so strongly that I, that's probably my core takeaway has been that it has taught me that there's an absolute prohibition on medical assisted dying or euthanasia. And the, the reason is quite simple. Some of the most powerful moments that you will ever hear or even ever experience in your own life will happen in those last moments. Um, we've heard testimonials from people who tragically lost people, even young children of theirs to cancer. But the last days, the last minutes, the last seconds, the last breaths mm. are when God shows up. Yeah. Um, I think three of my own loved ones breathe their last breath. You could never take those moments away from me. Those moments of seeing the holiness of God at the moment where he says, this is the end of the line. I'm taking this person home. Those are some of the most incredible moments that will ever be given. And to interrupt those moments is to steal away the work and the move of God and to say that I am God. God is not God, but that's not okay. It has to be to so my own takeaway and my own repentance. It has to be a total prohibition for the purpose of valuing the sanctity of every single life. I, I, I look to that passage in the book of Job where he's like, who made the, the deaf, the mute, the blind? Who made these? Mm -hmm. um, who, who is the one that is Lord over all good things and over suffering? Well, it's God Almighty. And we cannot enter the fray of what he has hold of. And life is that beautiful, beautiful gift that it's filled with mystery. I'm not saying it's, it's simple. I'm not saying there's not terrible suffering. But there needs to be a total prohibition and God forgive me for ever thinking that there could even be a difference it, just because of my own understanding of human pain and suffering. But no, I, I truly believe that's my takeaway. And um, I think that I, ho well, I hope that people feel the same way when they watch the whole series. You know, as I, as I speak around the world uh, about this issue, it, it, it it's very, very apparent that um, we are and what this series does we talk about I talk about girding ourselves for those days. I mean, these laws hit us when we are at our absolute worst. When, yeah. when you know, just just like Hippocrates knew that I will never give, I'll never get, don't, don't ever give uh, poison, even if someone were to ask for it. He knew back then, yeah. way before Christ, that we can't trust ourselves when we're at our lowest, and yet these laws are being put in place to hit us when we're at our lowest and say, you know what? I give uh, Matthew, I, I'm sure you have a, a, a takeaway for us from the series. I'll, I'll let you answer the same question. Yeah, well, I, I hopefully um, the audience captured some of those sentiments just with Mike Shouten's testimony and his story with his son who had extra days because they decided to, to live life to the fullest as long as they could with their teenage son who was dying of a terminal illness. Um, which medical assistance in death for mature minors is something they're pushing in Canada. And it actually in Netherlands, I believe that just came through today. Or yes. um, so it, it's just, um, again, I, I back to something I said before um, the screening was it's shocking how far this has gone and how, how far the government for one and the, and the people are allowing this to happen. I believe that, we have a moment here where we can raise our voice and put our foot in the door and stop, stop it from shutting permanently on people choosing life. Um, Cause this is really about choosing life. It's, it's not about, um, it's not about kindness. It's not about compassion. It's not about stopping suffering. That's what the front is. That's what that's what the words are that are being used. But look at the words they're being manipulated, made 
medical assistance in dying. Well, in 2021, they took away the meaning of that language. While we were in a pandemic and nobody was in parliament, nobody would, they voted with a, a fraction of the government in place and are pushing through um, just a redefining of terms, right? But so using the wrong terms isn't, isn't right, isn't good. And this is about, it is a life issue. It's about valuing life until the very end and suffering. We all deal with it regardless. Like everybody is going to deal with suffering on a certain level, but it's, um, are you going to live your life to the fullest? That's the question. I think that's the better question that people need to ask themselves. Yeah. Going back to your earlier comment, uh, Daniel, with regards to that, those, those, th- that precious time at the end, uh, when it is a natural death, it becomes that precious time, that time that we know our time is up. But when it, when it's made, it all becomes about May. This is, this is what I experienced in interviewing people in the films that I, that, that we did, um, that, that, that when it's made, it's all about made. It's all about when is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? What are the things? Bah, 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 bah. Yeah, there might be an end of life party or whatever, uh, which is, which is still, uh, extremely sad in those circumstances. But even then it becomes all about made. It all becomes about euthanasia. When's it going to happen? Who's going to do it? How, what is the procedure as opposed to that, those beautiful ends? Yes, we, we, we have. We have, and, I, and, and I'd like to hear your comment on this with regards to the solution. Everywhere I've traveled in the world on this subject, uh, the palliative care specialists say we have the means at our disposal to provide for proper pain management. The problem is not necessarily um, the problem is not necessarily uh, palliative care, but proper palliative care specialists and access to what we need in a healthcare system that will take care of these end of life situations. I wonder what you you had to say on that with regards to your conversations with people and medical doctors about the solution. They say, is, is it about pain? Is it about relieving pain? Uh, what do you, What is your comment to that? Yeah, it's most certainly a, a very almost tragically manipulative scenario where the people that are getting this are being, I think, in many cases, manipulated or tricked into it. Because the truth of the matter is, and many of these medical doctors we spoke to did tell us that all of the pain management things are available. There's like 99.9% of um, even nerve and other different types of pain that they can actually mitigate or even eliminate by different, um, you know, actual treatments, as opposed to a final treatment, like they call it, you know, which is actually just death. So they actually have those ability to, to treat the pain, but also it you really have to question a, a government and policy where at one side of their mouth, they're literally saying, we have a healthcare crisis in this country. We have a palliative care access crisis in this country. We cannot get, even within the 90 day window that the uh, original made, um, there was a track of made where you had a 90 day window to seek other options and, and be given every possible treatment option. You could not access palliative care in 90 days, but at the end of the 90 days, you could kill yourself. So it, it's a, it's just a absolute like Pandora's box conundrum going on where the, the government is saying one thing that when you then couple it with, but we can medically assist your death. Well, it doesn't make any sense other than they have an agenda like Matt alluded to, where when we started talking about the financial side of it, I mean, it's absolutely, it's absolutely crazy because you think, well, how much does it take to care for someone for the last year of their life, the last three years of their life, whatever their palliative care window might look like? Well, it's astronomical in comparison to the $1,500 that it costs to take somebody's life. And when you do it with someone in a white coat in a clean room, somehow people are tricked into thinking it's okay. But then we talk to other people and they say, I'm, I have a disability and I'm unwilling to go to the hospital because what if under some sort of mind trick or just coercion, they put me in a position where I say something and they actually line me up to kill me. I mean, to think that we could have a country that ha- had so many freedoms that we would then be free enough to take our own lives. I mean, this is a tragedy. And one of our favorite interviews was Dr. Kaysan Ugand, who is a Humber River Hospital made 
he's involved in the main team at a clinic and he's stepping down because of how far it has gone and how he is a psychiatrist and we're talking about soul condition of mental illness. He said, it's impossible. There's no way you could ever adequately assess in such a case. And so he's stepping down and saying, this is about the soul of our nation. And I 100% agree with him. This is a battle for the soul of Canada. I believe that it's going to take every last one of us speaking to the right people, sharing the message, getting this film out, talking to people about it, talking to MPs. If enough people raise their voice, then it will be a choir, a chorus that can actually change the game in Canada. And we have to do it. Matt, this is... uh... This is scary stuff. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, those of us involved in the movement and making films and 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 uh, uh, in exposing these lies. For those watching, this could this could probably feel rather scary. Are we overstating things? Um, and and then let's get into uh, as we kind of wind up things here. I'd like to talk about hope. I'd like to talk about you know mm-hmm. what can we do. But first of all, are we overstating this for those who would say, "Look, at you guys are fear mongering. You're out there. You know this is simply uh, this is simply out there for for those that uh, a very small percentage of the population who need it." I mean, we've heard all of the different excuses. Are we okay. overstating this? Are we fear mongering? What is your take? Um. I don't like to be a part of scaring people, but I would say we're scratching the surface, (laughs) to be honest. Um, When the numbers for 2022 come out, which they have not, um, which is a mystery, because I don't know if you recall during COVID, we had tickers counting by the day or by the week at worst. Isn't that How many people had died of COVID or with COVID? It turns out we found out it was numbers are very fabricated in that whole story. So even the numbers that we got made after 2022 will have surpassed all COVID deaths in Canada. So all the COVID, all the stuff we heard, all of the stickers on the floors, all the things we did during that pandemic, all the work, all the fear, if this, we're not hearing anything about May. So I would say we're scratching the surface. We're not sharing enough about it. We need to, I'm, I apologize if it's really hard, yeah. not from nothing I can do about it, but uh, something we've always done is bring people to issues. Um, that's something our filmmaking has always done is shared issues with people that they are haven't been thinking about. That's been our one of our goals. And usually it's through our own discovery process. And this is a, an exact example of that where we're discovering mm-hmm. things that it's we feel they need to be shared. And so I do think we're scratching the surface I will say, and maybe this can transition into your next thought there, was uh, as much as we're scratching the surface, there aren't that many people who are really pushing this and behind it. It's a small group of people, which maybe that's frightening. Maybe it's not. To me, it's not. To me, it's, it's like, let's get out there and expose the darkness and let's get rid of this problem, which is infesting our country right let's let's get life in front of people let's get hope in front of people and and you know that's really what people need when they're in that place where they feel like they need dignity and death most of these people need friends and family and support whether it's through the medical system whether it's through their family showing up um, we need care you know we need people to care for one another and that's the change that gives people, it, it changes your, your chemistry by having positive influence in your life. And that's something that we need more of in, in just community in general. So Canada is desperate for it. And now is a good time to start ramping that up. Yeah. I often speak about, uh, often speak about becoming a prophet of hope, becoming a prophet of hope. That's, that's something that I speak about every time I'm out, um, you know, whether speaking in public or or just trying to live out those things in a daily life. What I mean by a prophet of hope is is somebody who speaks hope into the lives of another. And we can do that through our words. We can do that through our uh, through our actions, through a visit, through um, bringing someone a small, you know, a little little thing of flowers. Just 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 being that prophet, or just sitting with. Sometimes in the hospital setting, all you can do is sit with. 
and, and be with. And, and that's the true meaning of compassion. Um, the other side of that, and Daniel, I'll, 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 I'll ask you about that. The other side of that is, is when we are low, when we are at our lowest, will we reach out for those prophets of hope in our life so that we don't despair? We're certainly not getting that from our government. They're saying, <laughs> they're saying, hey, you got made. There you go. That's the answer. As opposed to reaching out to those prophets of hope in our life who can advocate for us in the medical community, in our family, you know, at our churches. Where where are those prophets of hope? And when we're at our lowest, to be able to reach out to those to those people and, and those institutions that will offer that hope. What do you have to say to that, for uh, Daniel? It's so, so true and so important. And there might be some people who don't know this, and many of those watching might know this, but the Holy Spirit in the Greek, it actually means advocate. So when you think about being a prophet of hope, if you're coming alongside somebody and putting your arm around them and giving them the care, the meaning, the hope, the purpose that they need, you are embodying the role of the Holy Spirit. I don't think you can even do it adequately without the Holy Spirit. So if you can imagine, and people always wonder, well, like, I understand the Father, I understand Jesus. Like, what about the Holy Spirit? Well, it's the embodiment of the fruit of the Spirit in the world right now. That's the Holy Spirit. And to be an advocate for someone, whether that be at a hospital bed or in their darkest hour, or even just in their in their lightest hour so they can stay in a light hour, you know, um, I think that to be an advocate is to partner with the eternal work of the Holy Spirit. And how desperate are each of us for that? Because we've all been the one in a low place. We've all been the one that has felt the depression creeping in, the darkness creeping in. But let the light of those prophets of hope in your life, let the Holy Spirit actually be your comforter and your advocate. And if, if imagine if through this dark hour, Canada has this fight for the soul of our nation, if we actually became a country known as prophets of hope, people that advocated people that stood up. Maybe there's other nations we're going to have to stand up for in this fight in the near future. Maybe there's other um, states, regions, provinces, nations that we're going to have to step in and say, hey, we, we've like, because a prophet sees what's coming, right? And I believe that's the work of, uh, of us in this space and media and that you've been in the past as well. And that March for Life is involved in is it's, it, it's prophesying things that are also warnings. Guys, like we have to stand up and take warning, mm -hmm. take note. Let's not be blind fools. Let's take note of what's happening and respond. And um, so that I guess that would be my short answer, but long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Matthew, why don't you tell us a little bit about how folks can watch uh, watch this series, the, the remaining five episodes. Um, I understand you guys are crazy. They're free. Is that what I hear? Yeah, we're we're kind of slowly rolling them out. We're still working on them, so they're, we're going to release them as soon as they're available. Um, you can it's a user or a viewer supported uh, program. Um, this one we we've been funding it ourselves and with support from from people like like yourself who are supporting us with um, financial donation and with um, uh, we also have, we have our platform Unveil TV. So it's available on UnveilTV.com, and you can. You can donate through that, that platform or subscribe to our channel. Um, and the episode will come out for free, but there's going to be other stuff that's on there as well that some of it might be paywalled, um, some of it will not be. But um, also, if you're just to get all of the Made in Canada stuff that we're making, it's going to be madeincanada.org is a website you can just go to and that will have kind of the up-to-date stuff that we're releasing right there. But again, it's user supported. It's like any any help that we can get is great. It helps us sit in our editing chairs and do do more work. And and we really want to release all the um, full interviews and different things like that that we have shot. But there's a lot lot of content that we have, and uh, we'll we'll just be slow rolling it all out as as it gets finished. Um, so yeah, madeincanada.org and unveiltv.com are the two places to go. Well, God bless you both. I'm telling you, man, uh, putting it out there, having that trust that, because uh, I know uh, as a filmmaker myself and, and involved with, well, we're doing Row Canada, as you know, right now, and 
Uh, there's so much kind of just, you just put all your efforts, all your eggs in basket, hoping that the Lord will provide. And so I, I, I do encourage everyone watching tonight to, to support, uh, to support the work of, of Daniel and Matthew. You may remember uh, just a few months ago, or maybe it was last year. <laughs> Everything is just, uh, we had, uh, we had Breath of Life, that, that beautiful film, Breath of Life, um, uh, which we ran with, uh, with the Kuman brothers with Unveil TV. There's so much other programming that, that you, you folks are producing. Uh, so good for the heart, so good for the soul, so good for building up the spirit, the, the, the kingdom of God here in Canada. That's what we need. That's what, that's what's going to save us is, is, is building up that kingdom of God and allowing others to, to, you know, wherever you're at in your faith journey, who, whatever you're watching tonight, know that there is hope. There's hope in Christ. And, and we as a country, we were founded on this hope. We can get back there again. But as Daniel and Matthew have been talking about, we've got to get out there. We've got to do whatever we can. In our case, we're doing filmmaking and speak. In your case, you could be stamping envelopes, everything from stamping envelopes to coming out to the March for Life and, and actually witnessing being a part of a, uh, uh, being a part of a hospice organization, giving people that hope, that idea that we cannot we cannot judge today. We can't judge our future. Sorry. We cannot judge our future based on our feelings of today. That's just no way to do it. We have to look to those prophets of hope. We have to look to tomorrow to say, you know what? There is a reason for hope. There is a reason for those next weeks, those next months, uh, those next minutes. Because as Matthew and Daniel just talked about, it's in those final minutes when we really have that opportunity uh, to see what what life is all about uh, for encouragement of of, of, um, uh, of family reconciliation. I know from the stories that 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 that. that we film for our films so many stories of family reconciliation during those last few moments when, hey, what are we here for if we're not here for each other? And I truly appreciate the work of uh, uh, of you, Matthew and Daniel. I'd like to thank you on behalf of everyone uh, who's watching tonight and all of Canada. You know, in the years to come, we're going to look back and say, man, we wish we listened to you guys because <laughs> we're in not so good a place. Or... <laughs> we're in a great place because we actually expose the lies that are being perpetrated by this false euphemism called medical aid and dying. Any final words, gentlemen, before we sign off for the night? Just to uh, to agree with everything you just shared and to remind people of those parables that are so impactful and so simple, where even in absolute darkness, if you light one candle, it lights up a room. Or if you put one light on a hill for a city, Everyone from afar can see it. And that's what each of us can be in this country. Mm -hmm. And further to that is perfect love casts out fear. And we don't need to be afraid. Yeah. We know who wins. Yeah. We know yeah. who wins. Yeah. So uh, to all of you watching tonight, again, check out Unveil TV, uh, Made in Canada, the series. It's free. Of course, they're always looking for support. So please do support. And, and thank you for joining us tonight. We're going to do our best uh, to bring you more Life on Film features, uh, hopefully with the Kuman Brothers, I'm sure with the Kuman Brothers, uh, and in the years to come, uh, in the months to come, please stay tuned to marchforlife.ca, marchforlife.ca, and you'll find out when the next feature is happening. Uh, you've been watching us here on the YouTube channel for the March for Life. My name is Kevin Dunn, and uh, just been an honor and a blessing to be with you tonight. Reach out, be that prophet of hope to someone in your community, to someone who is suffering or, or hurting in any way. Um, and then of course, when we're low, let's, let's reach out to those prophets of hope in our life. Again, thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time on Life on Film. Good night, everybody.